our presenters tonight in order are Lisa Peterson, Beef Quality Assurance Specialist based at the Central Grasslands REC in Streeter. Jerry Stucka, Livestock Stewardship Specialist and Extension Veterinarian based in Fargo. Jana Block, Livestock Systems Specialist based at the Hedinger REC. John Dubetter, Livestock Systems Specialist based at the North Central <coughs> at Minot. Carl Hoppy, Livestock Systems Specialist based at the Carrington REC and Miranda Meehan, Environmental Stewardship Specialist based in Fargo. Also with us tonight uh, offering technical support is Scott Swanson, our Electronic Media Specialist based here in Fargo. Again, thank you, for, thank you all for joining us, and I'm going to turn this webinar over to Lisa. Well, good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us. Our speakers tonight, all of us as specialists, are uh, dealing with many of the same winter management issues and challenges that you are. And so uh, please feel free to ask questions. I was asked uh, to talk about assessing cow and bull condition and managing bulls in a tough winter situation. And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is body condition scoring. This is a really nice three-step system for body condition scoring. First, I'd encourage you uh, to look at the ribs of the cow or the bull. Uh, that's denoted by number one on your screen. If you can see those last two ribs, uh, um, that animal is in a body condition score less than five. If those last two ribs are not visible, that animal is in a body condition score five or greater. Next, we would encourage you to look at the spine. That's denoted by number two here on uh, the cow. If that spine is visible, uh, the animal is in a body condition score of three or less. Next, look at the shape between the hooks and the pins. In the dairy industry, we call that area the thorough. If that animal has a strong V shape in that area, that animal is in a body condition score too. If it's a, a, a strong V, but a little more flat, that would be a body condition score three. A V shape would be a body condition score four. And then as we move into a U shape in that area, it would be a body condition score five. And as we move into a flatter shape, those move into uh, body condition scores six, seven, and eight. In the United States, our beef body condition scores range from a one to a nine. A body condition score one is considered a, a cow or a bull that is starved, uh, very emaciated, and a body condition score nine is considered an animal that is obese. So let's look at body condition scoring. We would like to see our animals in a body condition score five to seven at calving time. Those are the two body condition scores on the right side of the screen here. So we'd like our mature cows to be in a body condition score five. Again, we um, are not able to see those last two ribs. The spine is not available, uh, it's not visible, excuse me. And the shape between the hooks and the pins is in a strong U shape. And so you can see that this cow, the top on the right hand side is in a body condition score five. The cow below her, we cannot see those last two ribs. The spine is not visible. And the shape between her hooks and pins is very flat. And so she's in a body condition score of six or greater. Now, why do we talk about this? Well, um, for every body condition score you lose, you lose between 80 and 100 pounds of weight. It takes a great deal of energy and cost to get cows up in that, to increase body condition score uh, at calving or right before breeding. And so we really are concerned about body condition score. There's a lot of impact on calf health, calf health and calf productivity along with cow productivity. We tend to forget about bulls when we manage in the winter time. And we certainly forget about looking at our body condition scores of bulls. So these are two bulls. Uh, the bull on the left um, is a body condition score five, again, just like our cows, we cannot see his last two ribs. We cannot see his spine. And that shape between his hooks and his pins is a, a strong U shape. So he's a body condition score five. The bull on the right is a yearling bull. This bull at uh, sale time had a back fat of about a quarter of an inch, 26 hundredths. And again, as we look at him, you cannot see his last two ribs. 
his spine's not available, and this area between his hooks and his pins is very flat. And so he's going to be a body condition score six or greater. So as we move into talking about bulls, we have bulls around to improve the, our herd, but also to breed our cows, right? And that's how we get that herd improvement. So let's talk about spermatogenesis. That's the fancy term for semen development. In bulls, that takes 61 days or about two months. And so anything that has happened in that period of time will impact semen quality and the ability to pass the breeding soundness exam. I always encourage people to think of semen development as a factory. So anything that has happened along that production in that line over the past two months will result in a lemon in the semen production system. We certainly don't want any lemons when it comes time to breed cows. So what's the effect of body condition score on semen quality in physically normal bulls? Waldner and Barth, um, they are out of the vet school in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, looked at body condition scores of bulls um, at, at uh, breeding soundness time, exam time, uh, in a time period from January to March, which is the green bars, and April to June, which is the yellow bars. We would ideally like to see bulls in a body condition score of four, five, or six at breeding time, and at turnout time. And here's the reason why. You can see that the body condition, uh, when we have those bulls and those body condition scores, the percentage of those bulls with satisfactory semen goes up significantly higher. So uh, we range from anywhere being 60% satisfactory uh, to 78% in a January to March timeframe for semen checking uh, to 80%, almost 85% in that April to June timeframe. So what happens when we buy yearling bulls or even two-year-old bulls at the local production sale? Typically, those bulls are a little heavier in condition because we are trying to optimize uh, production. We're trying to optimize weight gain and marbling in those bulls. And so you can see here on this screen that this shows a comparison of bulls that were weighed at sale time and then weighed again when they were tested and they looked at the percentage of bulls that would pass a breeding soundness exam. So in a short period of time after that sale, 74% of those bulls passed a semen, uh, 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 semen test or breeding soundness exam. At that point in time, those bulls were losing about seven pounds a day. When you get out to about 43 to 85 days after that sale, those bulls are losing still about two and a half to three pounds a day but only half of them passed a breeding soundness exam. So the take home message is, is that when we buy these bulls, uh, young bulls, a yearling bull or a two year old bull and take them home, we wanna make sure that we are still maintaining their quality of diet so that we don't lose a lot of weight, body condition and fat. So this year we are going to see a lot of bulls, or likely going to see a lot of bulls with scrotal frostbite. And so what's that impact on semen quality? So in this slide, satisfactory semen quality is in the green bar, questionable semen quality is in the yellow bar, and unsatisfactory semen quality is in the gray bar. I want you to look at the, the boxes with the red squares around them. So they looked at frostbite, and they graded frostbite by the number of scabs that were a penny or larger or a penny and smaller. Severe frostbite were those, scab, were those bulls that had one or more scabs on their scr uh, scrotum that were larger than a penny. Slight was one or more that were smaller. So when we look at severe frostbite in bulls that had breeding soundness exams, for example, conducted it from January to March, zero. None of those bulls had what we would consider to be a satisfactory breeding soundness exam. Somewhere around 30% had what we would consider to be a questionable one. As we move down here to May and June, you can see that the percentage of bulls that have satisfactory uh, uh, breeding soundness exams or semen quality increases significantly. So the take home message is to protect the scrotum and testicles from the cold. The, uh, easiest way, uh, most logical way to do that is with some good windbreak and good bedding. And so on the picture on the left, you can see that these bulls are bedded with some nice straw 
and there's some really nice uh, natural windbreak uh, through these trees. This can also be a man-made windbreak, how, uh, whether that happens to be stacks of bales or some of these portable windbreaks. As you can see in Canada, maybe they protect the scrotum and testicles of bulls a little bit different. They've utilized a crown royal sack. Uh, we know that that is maybe not appropriate here and, and the easiest thing to do. So in summary, uh, bulls should be in a body condition score of four to seven uh, at pre-breeding time and at turnout. We want those bulls to maintain condition through the breeding season, but we don't want them to be too fat. Maintain young, recently purchased bulls on a similar plane of nutrition and diet as they were when they were purchased, and then slowly step them down. If you have not done so, check out the body condition scores of your herd sires now. Ask someone who's knowledgeable about cattle to check out the body condition score of your herd, both your bulls and cows, too. Don't confuse hair, muscle, and or hay belly with uh, condition and get help developing a ration if you need to add some condition. This is really important in bulls because we don't want to get them too fat and we don't want to step them up on too hot of a diet. Uh, most of our county extension offices uh, have software and ration development ability if you need some help. Next, we talked about this. Bedding bulls and in fact bedding cattle is really important. Uh, provide some windbreak. Breeding soundness exams are really important. We need to have our bulls tested within a month of breeding season. That gives us enough time to find bulls if our bulls happen to not test well, but it also get, uh, is an appropriate amount of time uh, for them to have that breeding soundness exam be um, accurate when you turn them out. Don't save pennies to waste dollars by skipping a breeding soundness again, exam. Most veterinarians charge $50 to $100 for a breeding soundness exam. And while that seems like a lot of money, think about this. If your cows breed just 21 days later because your bull failed a breeding soundness exam, that ends up being somewhere around 50 pounds of weaning weight. If calves sell for a dollar and a half a pound, that is $75 per head that you have lost. You could have paid for that breeding soundness exam with just one calf. Remember that that semen test is only good for the day it was taken and that semen development uh, takes 60 days. And so with that, thank you. I wish you the best of luck in, uh, as we move into spring. And next, Dr. Jerry Stuck is going to talk about uh, managing calves that have been chilled and cold stressing calves. Thank you, Lisa. Good to be with you this evening. I know that uh, this is really not a topic that it's all that enjoyable to talk about we're going to talk about it anyway we've still got winter left and a storm coming and i hope none of you have to deal with cold stress calves but we're going to focus in for the next few minutes on talking about how we handle and how we deal with it and how we recognize it <clears throat> well these are the three things we're going to discuss we're going to talk about how to recognize a calf that may be in trouble and i'm sure that's Nothing new for those of you in the audience. You know how to tell when calves aren't doing well or doing right. We're gonna talk about some in for intervention and then maybe some things about what the outcomes might be. You know, I, I noticed some things that we're, all of us are gonna talk about and bedding and wind protection come into play here. And, and yet the snow monster are talking about, it does cause us some issues. It's supposed to be wet snow and Whenever we have those kind of conditions, the problem with moisture is that it decreases the level of insulation on an animal. It's not just the cows, but it's those calves. And uh, those, those calves with not a whole lot of body weight not a, and, and a lot of surface area, they tend to suffer the most when it gets to be these tough conditions. So you need to be doing what you can, be out there as often as you can during this tough weather. I know you're gonna probably lose some sleep over the next few days, but being out there probably saves you some calves. And so think about what your schedule is and if you can get somebody to check calves for you uh, during the nighttime or even, even the daytime so you can get some sleep sure helps. Barns do help in, a, in, a, in situations like that. And just a reminder to keep them as clean as possible and fresh bedding at this time of the year. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about behavior of animals that are under some 
stress and and cold stress and and remember that cold stress can happen in a lot of different outside temperatures i mean the critical temperature for calves is probably somewhere around 55 degrees so on all that means that is when the temperature goes below that they have to take in more energy to maintain that body heat and we'd like 55 degrees now but calves can handle it if they if they're able to get up and nurse and the mother takes care of them but the behavior that you need to be aware of that they'll exhibit when they're in cold stress is maybe standing off by themselves and hunched up and and of course you'll see that when they can't get out of the wind but they also can be just laying down even next to the mother and and you won't notice it and you need to determine whether that calf is nursed or not and sometimes I'll admit it's hard to it's hard to determine that but Look at the udder. Do the teats look dry? And when it's moisture outside, they probably won't look dry. They'll look wet. But is the hair on the udder dry? Are the udder quarters full? A lot of things to, to look for. But if you're still wondering, you need to put your fingers, and clean fingers preferably, in the mouth and see if that mouth is cold. If that mouth is cold, they have not nursed, and you're going to have to intervene. And and even beyond that, when you get a calf that's cold and vocalizing, that is a really bad clinical sign. And I sometimes use the term 5% chance of survival. So the prognosis in a calf that's vocalizing is, is really, really poor. We define hypothermia in calves as anything below 98 degree Fahrenheit rectal temperature. You know, newborn calves should be somewhere in that 99, 100, 102 we can actually have severe hypothermia down to 86 degrees. And those calves will definitely need to be intervened. I don't, I don't, I'm not telling you you need to run around with a rectal thermometer. I'm telling you that you can probably identify those calves that need help just by their behavior. If you have one, that's fine, but it's not something you need to, need to have to identify a calf that needs help. Um, this is just a reminder that better days are ahead. We will get through this March and we will have green grass and some of you will have calves on green grass. So just remember this doesn't, these next two days don't last forever. Just want to make a couple of comments about this. In order for a calf to maintain its, maintain its core temperature and maintain its life when it's cold out, he has to increase metabolic activity. And of course that happens when that calf leaves the uterine environment that's nice and warm and and safe and all of a shot now all of a sudden he shoved out into the the cold environment and so his metabolic activity has to really uh, jump ahead and get on board and there's some mention that the metabolic activity will increase 5x over the resting phase and and then what calves end up doing is they end up shivering and that helps them to to generate heat and i've got a comment in here below shivering it's, it talks about calving difficulty when a calf is having trouble being born or the mother's having trouble delivering that calf that actually is a detriment to that calf's ability to withstand cold temperatures because it messes with the metabolic activity uh, even a calf that's born unassisted is going to have increased cortisol and just a little bit of cortisol allows that calf to better utilize fat we're going to talk about brown fat in just a little bit but also the sugar stores, the glycogen and protein to create heat. And, and what happens in cold temperatures, in addition to increased metabolic activity, when it's cold out, there's vasoconstriction. In other words, the vessels will constrict and you don't have that, that blood flow to the ears and feet and tail. And that's why when it gets really cold and you see problems result, that's, that's the uh, pieces of the anatomy that, that get aff affected the most. Just a little comment on calving ease, just to back up what I just mentioned about calving ease and calves' ability to withstand cold and get up and nurse. I want to mention something about brown fat, and we don't often think about that. We think in terms of white fat. Well, calves are born with brown fat, and, and they have the unique ability, and it's gone after just a short period of time, but they have a unique ability to use that fat to keep warm. And, and cow, cow, calves that are born to cows an adequate body condition score back to what Lisa was talking about. Those calves will have a little better supply of brown fat that gets them through the tough times and gets them to get up and, and start nursing. So it's, it's a big deal. Having cows in, in adequate body condition score, especially in cold temperatures, is really important. 
Just a couple comments about colostrum. We'll come back to this again in just a bit. If you think about a calf in thermoneutral zone, thermoneutral zone, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but thermoneutral, thermoneutral zone for calves probably somewhere in that 50 to 55 degree Fahrenheit range. They need, in order to maintain their, their heat source, they need almost two thirds of a gallon of colostrum. Now, colostrum will differ for cow to cow and from, from breed to breed and dairy breeds and, and beef breeds, but just kind of an idea of what those calf ac calves actually need. And when that temperature falls below that thermoneutral zone, then they actually need a little bit more just to maintain their, their energy that they need per internal body heat. And remember that our beef cattle do an amazing job of acclimating to the cold. So when I talk about thermoneutral zone, I mean, our cattle grow longer hair, they do lots of things to acclimate to the cold. If they didn't, we wouldn't be able to raise cattle out, outdoors. I mean, even in temperatures way below zero, if the sun is shining and there's no wind and they're laying in bedding, those calves actually do extremely well. Frostbite is one of the, uh, one of the uh, side effects of this cold stress that you can have. It can have uh, frostbite right on the skin, but a lot of times what we see happen first is that the tips of the ears will freeze and then they'll necrose and then they'll fall off. And, and that's okay. Those calves will be okay if it's just the tips of the ears. The one that becomes really dangerous is when their feet freeze. And you'll notice, you can notice this early on perhaps when, when you feel the feet and they're just frozen solid. And if you don't notice it then, those calves will actually get up and move around and be fine. But after a day or so, maybe by 48 hours, those feet become swollen. They actually get a little, what I call squishy because there's edema fluid in the tissues and, and they, they're painful. And you can wait a while to see if somehow there's a miracle that occurs and they improve, but they're, most of the time they're not gonna be treatable at, those, at that stage and uh, those calves will likely have to be put down. So how do we heat those calves up? Lots of different ways, lots of different methods. You know, heaters, floor heats and blankets and hot boxes and I just want you to think about this though, because when a calf is really hypothermic, you know, I mentioned that 86 degree rectal temperatures is extreme hypothermia. It's gonna be hard to conduct enough heat through the hide to raise that internal body temperature. So, and, and in order to do that, really the calf has to also have the ability to, to produce heat. And that's why in both of these instances, those calves need colostrum. I know you're in a hurry to get that calf warmed up, but sometime during that period when you're warming, you, you got to provide colostrum because that allows calf, that calf to get some energy that it really needs. Warm water is, tends to be very efficient at warming calves. And some of you may have bathtubs available. Sometimes you need to carry them right in the house and put them in the bathtub, 100 degree Fahrenheit water. And I'd be, I'd, I'll just caution you a little bit Sometimes it's okay to warm those calves up a little bit with dry heat first so that it's not so much of a shock. So rubbing and, and putting external heat on is okay so you can start to raise some of that temperature, but the bathtub still may be needed in those calves that are extremely hypothermic and also they need colostrum. Yes, this is my famous picture of a calf in the bathtub and that one actually did survive, believe it or not. Um, just a couple comments again on colostrum itself. Fresh is the best, some is better than none, and sometimes you need to put that beef cow that doesn't know that you're trying to help her and the calf, got to put them in a head catch, and, and this is where you need some help. Uh, you need somebody to grab the tail near the base and move it to a vertical position so she won't kick so much, and put your head in that flank and milk the nearest teeth, and then once they kind of calm down, you can kind of release some pressure, but that fresh colostrum is the best energy source, immune source that those calves need. Frozen colostrum is fine. I prefer if you harvest it from your own herd. I'm a little leery of taking frozen colostrum from other herds and from dairy herds. There are colostrum substitutes on the market today. And look at the label, make sure they got a minimum of 100 grams of immunoglobulins that those calves need. I know I always get questions about brandy and whiskey and five hour energy drinks. Brandy and whiskey, I'm pretty sure are, are designed for human consumption. I'm not sure about five hours. I don't know of any studies done on them. So stick with the things you know. 
colostrum is the best. I'm gonna pass this over at this time to Jana Block, our extension livestock specialist out in Hedinger. Jana, you take it away. All right, thanks, Jerry. Okay, so I'm gonna be visiting with you a little bit about how to evaluate your nutrition program. And I know it's been a long haul for many of us and um, still looking like we're facing a little bit of winter. So it's important to be really critical and evaluate what's going on with your nutrition programs as we try to finish out the rest of this winter and head into spring. So things that we need to consider are obviously quality and quantity of our base diet. Most of the time that's gonna consist of forage. So don't be like the guy in this uh, cartoon here and let the white tail show you which are the best bales. Um, get your hay inventory conducted and I'll talk about an example of that um, shortly. And also make sure you get nutrient analysis conducted so that you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, obviously you have to know what different types of production groups um, that you have to take care of. If you've got some first calf heifers, some old thin cows, your mature cows, your bulls, those are all going to have different requirements and you're going to need to feed them strategically based on your feed resources. Most of you are calving now or you have been for some time, and so that's gonna impact requirements in terms of when your cows get to peak lactation, which is approximately 60 days after calving. Um, that's also going to um, really kind of match up with our pasture turnout dates in terms of when we have to feed that high quality forage when requirements at their highest. What's the condition of our cow herd? Evaluate body condition score, and I'll talk about a couple of other strategies to kind of monitor nutrient status. And then of course your considerations are gonna always come back to the bottom line. What kind of costs are you looking at? What facilities and labor do you have available? And you might need to consider some alternatives um, rather than just a full feed um, hay diet. Okay, so this chart gives you just some rule of thumb for estimating hay intake based on energy content or TDN, total digestible nutrients. So as you can see here, the low quality forages will have the least amount of intake. That's just due to bulk or physical fill due to fiber content. And so our dry cows are going to be able to eat around 1.8% 1, 1 of their body weight of that low quality forage. Lactating um, cows will increase the intake of that. And again, intake will just continue to increase as forage quality increases. And I have just an example of down here on the bottom of comparing intake of a low quality forage at 30.8 pounds to a high quality forage at 37.8 pounds. So again, that's where understanding the quality of your forage is helpful. And this can be used when you're looking at your hay inventory and trying to figure out um, what the intake should be on various forages based on quality. So Jerry kind of mentioned the lower critical temperature. So in beef cattle, that's just the temperature below which they have to utilize energy to maintain body heat. And so in mature cattle, we're talking about 32 degrees with a dry winter coat or 18 degrees with a heavy dry winter coat. And so as the temperature starts to decline, you can see that feed intake will increase, energy for production is lost, and the maintenance requirement increases. So we can utilize the ambient temperature and wind speed to calculate an effective temperature. And we use this effective temperature to determine how much additional energy those cattle are gonna require just to maintain body heat. So again, a basic rule of thumb is to increase TDN or energy by 1% for every degree below the lower critical temperature. So if we have the dry heavy winter coat that I talked about in the previous slide, our lower critical temperature is 18 degrees. So we have air temperature of zero and a wind speed of 20, we're looking at an effective temperature of minus 39. So we take our lower critical temperature minus our minus 39, and those cows are gonna require 57% more energy. So just going through some nutrition calculations here, and I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. Um, I can definitely get you copies of this slide or you can print it um, from the webinar later. Um, just showing you the relative difference in how much energy is going to be required by that cow just based on that wind speed and temperature. And so if we were able to feed that cow the amount of forage that she's gonna to need to meet her energy requirements, she'd be eating 3.6% of body weight 
Uh, that might be possible in some feedlot diets. Um, that's still on the high side and probably not possible with our forage-based diets. So we have to find some other ways to reduce maintenance requirements and the amount of feed that those cows are going to require. So just a couple ways that you can do that. Um, many of you are probably already doing some of these things. Um, need to think about providing some higher quality forages or grain or byproduct feeds, just more energy dense feeds. Um, again, forage will generate the most amount of heat per unit, but we can't get enough forage into them um, based on that really high energy requirement. And it's also difficult for cattle to utilize poor quality feeds when it's cold because intake increases, passage rate increases, and nutrient utilization will actually decrease. And so just providing the higher quality feeds is a good idea at that time. Separating off thin and young cows separate and feeding them separately is a good idea if you have the facilities, um, just to give them a little more attention. And again, be strategic about the cattle that you need to maybe provide a little more um, nutrient dense feeds. Also, Lisa mentioned it, Jerry mentioned it, windbreaks and shelter are really critical. Um, that's gonna really help reduce the effect of the wind chill and reduce that effective temperature. Um, if natural shelter isn't available, need to get out there and provide some portable windbreaks, tires, hay bales, whatever you've got. A lot of you already probably feed in late afternoon or early evening if you can stand it. I know a lot of times it's hard for producers to uh, kind of wait to feed, uh, but basically what that does is just kind of generates more heat of fermentation um, later or in the middle of the night when those cattle need it the most and typically the temperature's at the lowest. Wanted to just mention hay waste. Um, most producers are utilizing um, round bales and um, that's good for minimizing labor, but we do know that studies have shown that waste is, um, can be pretty high um, when you're rolling out bales, 20 to 45%. So you are in the situation where you're having to unroll bales out on feed ground. It's a good idea to try to limit access. A one versus a four day supply, they've shown that um, hay is, hay waste is reduced by 20%. So obviously, if we're coming into a blizzard situation and you feel like you need to put a few days of feed out, go ahead and do that. This is just thinking long-term um, over the entire feeding period, providing it one day at a time is probably your best bet. Feeding on fresh ground, if possible, is gonna be important to increase utilization and intake. And then obviously feeding low quality hay first and trying to encourage them to um, consume all that before they go to the high quality feeds. It's really difficult to put out high quality feed and then kind of force them to go back and consume that low quality forage. So we're thinking about reducing waste. A couple things come to mind, obviously using a bale processor. So basically that just functions to reduce particle size, increase passage rate, and then increase intake. So it's a good way to increase utilization of low to medium quality forages. Um, disadvantages, possibly some increased costs due to labor, fuel, investment in equipment. Um, you can also get some leaf loss, particularly on windy days, which we have a lot here in North, North Dakota. Um, so that's just some consideration. You can look at your increased feed availability and utilization versus the amount of cost that it's gonna um, take to get you there. Hay feeders are certainly another option. Um, they've been shown to really reduce feeding losses. Uh, it doesn't work in every situation, obviously, but the cone feeder um, with a waste panel at the bottom is definitely um, the, a consistent feeder that results in the least amount of hay waste. So this just goes back to calculating, um, you know, conducting a hay inventory and calculating how much you're gonna need to get you through the rest of the winter. Uh, again, just a couple of examples here. So we, we need to know body weight of our cows. We need to know the percent of body weight as forage that they're consuming, and that's based on forage quality, which you get from your forage analysis. And then we're gonna need to calculate in a waste factor here to get uh, pounds of forage consumed per cow per day. Just an example, 1,400 pounds, eating 2.5% of body weight. I put in a waste factor of 25%, and so they're gonna be eating right, needing right around 44 pounds per cow per day. If we have a 60-day feeding period to get through, hopefully we're gonna have green forage available after that. And so that's the total amount of forage needed per cow. You also need to know your bale weights and your dry matter. Again, that's through nutrient analysis, and so, Based on our bale weight and the 90% dry matter, that's how much dry matter we have available per bale. 
So we end up right around 2.2 bales per cow. And you could do a quick estimation of this just based on one bale per cow per month, adding in a little bit of extra, like I said, for waste. And this doesn't necessarily mean that this is exactly how much each cow needs. Um, you're gonna have to adjust based on temperature, condition, forage quality, and all those other factors that we've kind of talked about. When you do look at supplementing some low quality forages, it's important to know um, what your goal is and how to most effectively meet that goal. And so if we're talking about low quality forages that have less than 7% protein, that's the point at which ruminal fermentation could be limited. And so we need to look at providing a high quality protein supplement containing greater than 20%. So we've got alfalfa hay, soybean meal, distillers grains, um, the nice thing about cows is they can be fed these every two to three days because of their ability to recycle nitrogen. If you've got a forage with greater than 7% protein, um, might need to look at supplying an energy supplement. And again, that's going to be based on the different requirements of your various production groups. And you need to kind of look at whether you choose a fiber versus a starch-based supplement. So some of our fiber supplements are soy hulls, wheat mids, and distiller's grains. And our starches are our feed grains, corn, barley, and other things like that. So we know if we feed too much starch on a forage-based diet, it's gonna reduce digestibility and intake of the forage. And that's just based on changes to the microbial population. So there's some things you can do to st be strategic and make sure um, that you're meeting those needs effectively without too much impact on the microbes. Just wanna quickly show you a feed cost calculator. Um, this was developed jointly by the North Dakota Farm Management Education Program and NDSU Extension. Um, this is just a simple Excel spreadsheet and you can go in and customize um, all of your uh, feedstuffs and you can put in weight. Um, we thought it was really important to include your trucking costs, um, how many miles that you have to incorporate when you're evaluating that. So you get a total trucking cost. You can go down here to nutrient content and use your values from your feed analysis. Um, and plug those in, it'll calculate your dry matter per ton, your, your energy and protein per ton, and what you end up with is dollar amount per pound of nutrient. And so that's what we want you to use to compare supplements when you're trying to make those supplementation decisions. And just a couple additional considerations before I turn it over to John. Um, really important to not forget about water. We know that cold use is going to increase um, metabolic water use. And so this time of year, we don't think about cows' water requirements as much as we do in the heat of summer, but they still require adequate water for making sure that we get good feed digestion and utilization um, and maintain performance and health, especially with lactating cows. So probably minimum a gallon per 100 pounds of body weight. I know people have had a huge amount of challenges this year, um, just dealing with ice in the tanks. So couple different options here for tanks that maybe aren't um, next to an electric source, a propane stock tank heater, there's water circulators. Some of those may result in some excess um, water flow. And so that can be a challenge, but um, check into different products that are available out there. And then another thing is you just need to, um, once we get your forage analysis done, your hay inventory done, you wanna take a look at how that's performing in your cow herd. Um, again, evaluate that body condition score and take a look at manure consistency. Um, this pile here where there's not really a lot of solid ring shows that that cow's getting a little bit of excess protein. Um, here we have adequate protein, but you see some rings um, and, it, and there's usually a crater type appearance um, at the top of the pile. And then down here we get into deficient protein. There's definitely um, very obvious rings and usually this uh, manure pile would be very firm. And so that's just one other option for evaluating um, the nutrient status of your herd. Again, I've known I've uh, thrown a lot at you tonight. Be sure and contact me if you have questions or put them in the chat box. And I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to John Dubetter, and he's going to talk to you about stretching limited hay. Thank you, Jana. Welcome to anybody who might have joined us on the webinar. Uh, up here in Minot, we've had a couple days of reprieve from the weeks and weeks of bitter cold wind chills, uh, which stressed a lot of things, equipment, people, livestock, and calves. And unfortunately, I think we're all aware that there's some more stuff coming to North Dakota and some new challenges with some blizzard conditions.
it's truly amazing to me just how hardy our cattle are as these pictures kind of illustrate um they can cope with a lot when we do our part to get them out of the wind have a little back fat on them and keep their room in full so they generate some heat of fermentation and have some energy to deal with the wind chills and the cold in the cases when we can't do that for one reason or another we got some cattle suffering from some lameness or age it's pretty conceivable to have cows lose three or four pounds a day in a condition score within less than a month of time we've talked about how their energy needs go up with the cold and the wind chill. And along with that, their appetites go up, their rate of passage goes up, they can eat more feed, and we as stockmen give them more feed because it's absolutely necessary. What that does though, is it puts us in a position now that some things have happened. What we thought was an adequate feed supply all of a sudden is starting to look a little short. And we've got some instances of people running a little low and concerned that their hay might not get them to where they need to go. How that happens is just looking at what we've had to do. If we've been feeding 35 pounds of hay normally under more normal weather, and we've had weeks upon weeks of extreme weather with minus 40 and 30 wind chills daily, and we've fed 50 pounds, we've all of a sudden fed 40% more hay over those two months. That's led us to a situation where we might have to adapt some management to stretch the hay that we still have. We're not to anywhere close to grass. Uh, for most of us, turnout might be in mid-May, even late May, so we need to have a plan on how we're gonna get there. One of the things that we can do is we could probably go out and try to find some additional hay. The reality of it, of being able to find it at the cost we might be able to locate it for is probably time to look at some other alternatives. Most cases feeding some grain or concentrate feed and limiting the hay somewhat might be an option that we really have to consider. consider. I've got two rations in this slide, one for the last month of gestation and one for the, uh, and one for the first month of lactation as calving is undergoing right now. We know what a cow needs for her energy needs, and we know we can supply that with medium to better quality hay if we fed 40 pounds in late gestation or fed 45 pounds in early lactation. If we don't have that much hay, we could restrict the hay to probably 30 pounds, feed five or six pounds of corn, and then with the bedding and a little extra straw out there to help her get content and fill up her rumen, we could still meet her TDN or energy needs. If we happen to have a limited supply of hay, but we're long on silage, we can adjust the ration as well to feed a lower percent hay, maybe a third hay, two thirds or more silage, and we can meet her needs that way. Now I recognize some people are a little careful about how much silage a high energy feed they can feed at calving time, a little concerned about high milk production to a young calf who can't handle it, and potential will cause some digestive or scouring calves, but we can manage that by limiting that to an appropriate level. Feeding grain is a little different than feeding hay, so we got to take things a little slower and understand that we got a potential to cause some digestive problems if we don't do it right. For the most part, it's a new feed to cow, it's a fast digesting feed, and it should be introduced into the ration fairly slowly. We don't want any cows to overeat too fast, create an acidotic uh, rumen and uh, might have some consequences of bloat and founder and so forth. Typically we also want to try to feed these starchier grains at a low percent of the ration just so we don't interfere with the digestion of the fiber that might be in the ration and we still get the value out of our forages. Generally that's feeding less than four tenths of a percent of body weight or in the cows in this state that might be four to six pounds. For wheat and barley we know cracking them Breaking the seed coat is going to create or enhance the digestibility of those feeds. Uh, and we also, like Jana said, some of our rations may be short of protein and maybe a grain byproduct, which is typically higher in protein, may be more appropriate than feeding just a straight grain. As well as when we feed these byproducts or a higher grain ration, they're high in phosphorus, low in calcium, 
we might want to consider that uh, our or check our mineral to make sure we're not overfeeding phosphorus and underfeeding calcium and pick a mineral with the right blend or proportions of those two. But most importantly, if we're going to feed a limited amount of grain to a herd of cows, we have to have a way of getting it out there, getting it distributed, so we don't have some cows eating excessive amounts and some cows not getting enough. So we got to give each cow her fair share and distribute the grain over a pretty wide area for that to happen. One of the biggest challenges is how you do that. How do you get four or five pounds of grain to your cows in a timely manner and everybody gets a share and it's hard to handle grain if all you've got is a loader tractor. For most people who, or for people who are feeding a mixed ration with the feed wagon, certainly just weighing in the grain, adding it to the mix of forages and feeding it out works very well. Some people are not equipped with silage or don't feed silage. And uh, so we got some other options with that. And we could probably get a cake feeder or cake box, uh, go out there and put it all on the ground, or we can add an attachment to a, uh, you know, a bale processor. Some of them have hoppers. You can put 20, 30 bushels of uh, corn or grain in and top dress the, the shred hay. Feeding grain has also got some challenges and that sometimes it's pretty difficult with a large herd of cattle to feed them in such a way that we can actually uh, uh, minimize the waste. Uh, you know, if we've got hard frozen ground, dry sod, or compacted snow and ice, you know, cows will do a pretty good job of licking up grain off of those surfaces. However, if we get some slush and mud and deep snow, it won't work very well. Um, in those cases, we almost have to go to feeding these things in some kind of a bunk uh, system. Or if we're feeding it on the sod or the ground, certainly it's even better to feed small piles, such as with a trip hopper on your feeding attachment. So we put little piles over a row rather than a continuous, very small, shallow line of grain. Certainly, uh, grain feeding is a way to stretch our forage a little bit. It's also uh, something that we might be kind of required to as hay pile, the hay pile just, uh, just diminishes and we just have to uh, stretch everything. So uh, uh, we're going to do what it takes and I, I commend you for being the stockman you are and, and you know taking care of these cattle under these difficult conditions. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carl Hoppe and he's going to talk to us a little about where maybe we can source some of these additional feeds. Thank you, John. I know in, in our part of the world here, uh, winter's really been extended cold and our hay reserves have been used up pretty quickly this year and we're now looking for other options to uh, uh, supplement our cow herds. So alternative feeds are certainly one of those things that can be used. Co-product feeds are moderate to high in Protein, they're moderate to high in energy content as well. A couple of things that poor quality forages, straws definitely need to have added to it. So co-products work well as a supplement or a partial replacement for a forage-based ration. Works excitingly well for low quality forages like straws or slough haze, or if we've already used our good quality feeds and we need to add something to the poor quality feeds, co-products certainly are something that work out quite well. Surprisingly, North Dakota has many co-products, mills, crushes, refineries, and processing plants across the state. When you get to other states, they don't have the number of opportunities that we have in North Dakota. Now, I recognize that most of these crushes and mills and processing plants are located on the eastern part of the state, which means that we have ready access on our side and the western side of the state. They have the same access, but they have freight costs that need to be added. Just how much co-products do we produce in North Dakota? There's two examples that I'll share of just how much volume we produce. Our state mill and elevator that's owned by the state of North Dakota, it's the largest single Durham wheat mill located in the world at one location. There's other companies that are bigger, but we actually have the largest in one location. It mills 90,000 bushels of wheat a day, or Durham, into flour or semolina. That means it produces a co-product. They, they mill out the starch, the co-product, the fiber, and the proteins are left over, 
and that's called wheat mids or wheat middlings, and they produce 100 ton a day, which is around 33 semi loads. Just to give a feeling, at 10 pounds per head per day, um, they produce enough feed to feed 20,000 head of cattle uh, daily. North Dakota has 900,000 head of cattle or almost a million head of cattle, so you can see that 20% of our of our cow herds in North Dakota could be fed just what we produce out of this one particular meal. And it's a high quality feed of 18% crude protein and 83% CPM. Even more production in co-product feed is found in our ethanol distilleries across North Dakota. We have five plants in North Dakota. They produce um, 3,000, 3,500 to 4,000 tons daily of distillers grains. It's on a dry matter basis. Given the cow inventory that we have, we could feed seven pounds of distillers grains utilize this feed to every cow every day. Or if we just looked at a seven month period, we could feed 12 pounds of distillers grains per day. There's that much product produced in North Dakota. 12 pounds of distillers grains would really take the edge off of how much hay is needed for a cow ration. Not only that, if you look at 30% crude protein, you're giving almost three and a half pounds of crude protein per cow per day which just is a heck of a lot of protein to provide to a cow. But on a poor quality ration, that might be something a cow certainly needs this time of the year. Again, it's 38% crude protein and 86% TDM. Again, high quality feeds. Co-products, there's two big issues that occur with them, and that's gonna be the pricing of it as well as the freight. Freight costs can get to be pretty high. It's very competitive with other local feeds when you look at the price of these co-products, but you have to include the price of the freight. Western North Dakota certainly will have a higher cost than our eastern part of North Dakota. It has to compete with our other feeds like grains, haze, and, and other available co-products, but uh, there are some limitations on our co-products. There are some long-term storability issues with some. Wheat mids tend to take moisture out of the air and consequently mold. Um, unless they've been put on an air floor during the summertime. The distillers grains used to have a bridging problems with it. It can still have. Uh, things like distillers, uh, excuse me, um, wheat mids uh, is very light and fluffy unless it's pelleted, which increases the density twofold and makes it a lot easier to transport. Some feeds like uh, um, the, the wet corn gluten feed or the wet distillers grains or beet tailings or beet pulp all are high in moisture and of course mold can become an issue too. Calculating the cost per pound of nutrient can easily be done. Um, it's, it's just a matter of taking the feed uh, that you're going to be using and taking the cost per ton and dividing it by the energy content of the feed. So in this example, I used $90 a ton wheat mids that has an 86 TDN. You do the math and all of a sudden your cost per pound of protein, pound of TDN or energy content is five cents a pound. If you need these TDN values, go to our NDSU AS 1182 Alternative Byproduct Feeds publication, and it has a, a directory of, of uh, prices uh, of, of TDN values in the end, not price of TDN values. We have a bunch of co-products across North Dakota. Um, in most part, they're all low in starch and high in fiber and high in protein. Feeds that are perfect for a cow herd that's being fed a low, for, a low um, quality forage. In the milling process or fermentation process, most of the starch is removed in these products and, uh, or the oil, if it's an oil seed. Result is gonna be something that's very high in fiber and usually high in protein too. And this fiber I need to point out is very digestible in a ruminant diet. Distillers grains are produced in five different plants in North Dakota, third Senesanol at Castleton, Hankinson Renewable Energy at Hankinson, Dakota Spirit Ag Ethanol at Spiritwood, Blue Fun Ethanol at Underwood, as well as Red Trail Energy at Richardson. Um, it's a very popular feed. You can see uh, some of the values over here of, it's very palatable, that, that's an understatement. Cows really go after this feed quite well. It mixes well with other feeds, conditions of feed. Maybe there's a limit to 30% of the diet, this is some of the sulfur issues that you want to use. There are ethanol plants in other parts of the, in South Dakota and other states that can be trucked into North Dakota too. Right now they've raised the price of distillage grains so it's um, still cost competitive but at $160 a ton, it's no longer one of the cheapest feeds out there that we can provide to our cow herd. 
Wheat middlings is another option. There's five plants in North Dakota that produces wheat mids. Dakota Growers in Carrington, Minot Milling in Minot, Ardent Milling down at Fairmont, of course, North Dakota Mill in Alva that we talked about at Grand Forks, and to a lesser extent, the plant up in Kandu. Uh, some of these have already been, uh, their source of supply has been booked out for the year. Although at the mill and elevator and Dakota growers, availability is still available and at 80 or $90 a ton turns into a fairly competitive feed. Corn gluten feed is created um, through the process of a wet corn milling, which is the plant located down at Wapton, North Dakota at Cargill. Of course, wet corn milling makes high fructose corn syrup and um, the leftover product is 83% TDN, 20% protein, very palatable. Um, it can be sold as either dried or wet. Uh, you need to contact these people because usually availability is, is rather reduced because they're sold out. It's that popular of a feed. It's very palatable. Soy hulls is a product that we haven't had in North Dakota unless we freighted in from Minnesota or South Dakota until the recent several years. Now the ADM plant in Enderlin is producing soy hulls uh, since they're now crushing North Dakota soybeans. It's a high energy content feed, it's pelleted, its protein can range from eight to 13%, so be sure to know what your product is if you may not be considered a protein source uh, for your feed, but it certainly is a replacement for, for our feed. I do have to point out that it's usually high in calcium and low in phosphorus. Most of our other co-products are always high in phosphorus, maybe triple times the amount of phosphorus it would be in grain. And of course, calcium is quite low and like John identified, uh, adding extra calcium to co-product feeds is always indicated. If you're located close enough to a beet pulp plant or a sugar refinery like American Crystal in Hillsboro, Drayton, East Grand Forks or Kirkston, or even Mindac down at Wapaton, uh, they have a supply of beet pulp and tailings that they usually, well, at least American Crystal, provides at no cost other than trucking. Of course, it's, you need to be on the list to be able to get it. And if you have a trucker that hauls that, this is a product that works quite well. Uh, think of it as a nice replacement for silage if, it's, uh, if you're feeding the wet pulp or the wet beet tailings. Be sure to note the moisture content is quite high. So that's what limits trucking to usually around 100 miles away from the plant before other sources of feed get to be uh, priced more competitive. We do have protein sources or crushes in North Dakota. Canola mill is very popular if that's all you need. It's usually price competitive. It's produced in Velva as well as Endolin or West Fargo, even up at Hollick, Minnesota. These plants are available. Um, linseed mill is crushed in, in Cargill in West Fargo um, on a sporadic basis, but it is available. Soybean mill is priced very high and it works quite well um, if you want to use soybean in your ration. Uh, that's produced on ADM and Endolin, 46% crude protein. The real bargain on these particular protein sources right now is sunflower meal. So if you're needing protein, uh, sunflower meal could be $120 a ton, even less than that. Um, and it's available out of Cargill and West Fargo, and it can be available out of Northern Sun and Enderland. If you need to have a list of co-products, uh, both the phone numbers as well as a recent price, please go to our Carrington Research Extension Center uh, homepage on the internet and look for livestock and then look for livestock extension and then click on sources and prices for selected co-products in North Dakota. And with that, uh, good luck in trying to source extra feed for your cow herd if you're running yourself short on hay and can't find hay. There is a, a vast amount of co-products available in North Dakota if you can find out what's available. Our next speaker is going to be Miranda Meehan. She's our environmental, livestock environmental sewage specialist, and Dr. Meehan is here to talk to us about pasture and range turnout issues. Good evening. So I'm gonna change paces a little bit here and talk about as what we expect as we look forward to a greener grass, um, especially into some strategies to help you plan for the, two, the 2019 grazing season. One thing I want to keep you all to keep in mind is that yes, we do have a lot of snow and there's a lot of moisture in that snow, but due to the timing of melt and, and how things melt, a lot of that snow is gonna be runoff and yes, it's gonna be great for refilling some of our stock dams and surface waters. However, that is not gonna be available 
there's not going to be the principal source of responsible for our forage production this year. 80% of forage production in North Dakota comes from precipitation in May and June. So don't be making your grazing management decisions based off of the available precipitation snow that we have right now. So when we when I talk we talk about preparing for our grazing season and when should we put, be putting those cattle out there? I know a lot of people use the calendar date. The ideal way to do this is to look at grazing readiness based off of plant development or you can estimate it using growing degree days. We do have a publication that goes through that, so I'm not going to go in detail. The simplest way is to go out there, look at plant development for introduced pasture species such as crested wheatgrass, smooth brome grass, meadow brome. That would be the three leaf stage. And so you just simply are going to count the leaves starting from the bottom, one, two, three. And then for our native species, it would be the three and a half leaf stage. And why do we use this as a rule of thumb? It's important to be looking at this and not grazing our, our plants too early because grazing too early can stress those plants out and actually result in up to a 60% decrease in your forage production for the grazing season. As a typical rule of thumb, we expect that our crested wheatgrass is ready early May. Um, our bromes, smooth brome grass, meadow brome grass being the most common, typically ready to graze in mid-May. If you have post-contract CRP land, that's typically um, stuff that's coming out of contract is typically um, some of our tall intermediate wheat grasses. And you can expect that to be available in late May. And our native pastures typically aren't ready until um, earliest is early June, depending if you're cool or warm season dominated. And that would be our cool season dominated pastures, which are most common across the state. Um, however, I want to keep in remind you and is that th there is a lot of variability. So we don't want to we want to be careful when just looking at those states. Um, it varies across the state. Some research that we've been doing with the with the extension agents across the state shows two week variability between counties um, when different species are available to graze. And also we have year to year variability. So just because that's the date you were able to start grazing last year does not mean that that's when our species are going to be available to graze this year. Um, so the last two years, I have been working with some of the county agents across the state to monitor grazing readiness for um, our, some of our common pasture species, crested wheatgrass, smooth brome grass, and then um, our most common native species, which would be Western wheatgrass. We also have some looked at green needle grass, but there's some challenges there because it's a little bit more difficult to identify early in the grazing season. In 2017, we found that um, crested wheatgrass was, a, was ready to graze um, at that three leaf stage around May 4th, where our brome was actually earlier at um, late April, April 24th, where our Western wheatgrass wasn't available wasn't at the three and a half leaf stage until the end of May, almost Memorial Day. One of the reasons you're probably wondering why is crested wheatgrass behind smooth brome grass when I said that should be available to graze earlier. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you remember that we warmed up pretty early in 2017, but then we had um, a little a cold snap later as things were starting to grow and that set some of our grasses back, including the crested wheatgrass which was further in development at that time. I did, at, did get a lot of pictures from county agents where they were out there monitoring grazing readiness and they had pictures of the grass with snow. Looking at 2018, um, our crested wheatgrass was similar. We were at May 11th and then our smooth brome grass was actually two weeks later at May 7th, so typically around where we would normally expect it to be. Um, our western grass was about the same at that, that end of May, May, at May 20th, it was this year. So one of the things that we've seen here, though we actually seen a delay in some of the species um, because 
of the drought of 2017 and depending on if those areas if pastures were grazed hard um, they see a decrease in in productivity and a delay in grazing readiness in some areas so i, I expect something similar this year with we will have a delay in our grazing readiness because it's gonna there's a delay with all the snow when our plants are going to start growing and photosynthesizing and our ground's going to take longer to warm up how long that delay is going to be i can't say right now we do plan on working with with the agents across the state and monitoring again this year so hopefully we can keep you up to date on that as we move forward I know a lot of you are probably itching to get out and get your cows out of lots and especially with the snow when it starts to melt you're going to have a mess and really want to you want to get them out of there um, you're also running hay, short on, on hay supplies so here there's some strategies that we can look at to get them out there a little earlier but we, while reducing that the stress to those those pastures and i'm talking about these in what i would say um, the order of preference. So ideally, if you can, um, looking at supplementing on hay or pasture land, um, pasture again native, or it would be those tame grass species, not native, um, specifically things like the bromes and your and your crested, and then pr providing them some additional forage if you forage if you still have it available, or supplementing with some of the other products that Carl talked about. The next one thing to look at would be grazing some of those domesticated grass pastures. Then moving in, if you don't have that as an option, utilizing some of your winter annuals for spring grazing, those should be available early May. Um, so things like triticale, rye, or winter wheat, if, if you planted those last fall. Then the next thing, if, if those aren't options for you, would be evaluating what you have for native native pastures, native rangelands. Um, we have a, a pretty big issue across the state with Kentucky bluegrass invading our native rangelands and, and becoming dominant on, on a lot of pastures, especially eastern portion of the state. So if you look at this picture here, this would be a pasture, or a pasture that's been taken over by Kentucky bluegrass. And so that would be a, a good option if you're going to graze native range, if you have a pasture looks at, like that starting there actually could help decrease your Kentucky bluegrass grazing it early in the season and give some of your natives a, a competitive advantage. One thing is that this would be very low in protein, so you definitely would need to supplement protein in this situation. And then finally, if, if you have to graze native pastures, um, choosing one that's dominated by cool season grasses. And if you're not sure about composition, need some help with the identification, contact your extension agent or your NRCS. I'm sure they'd be happy to come out and help you with that. A few other considerations which we haven't talked about yet is this is with especially with this coming storm, we're talking in record level historic storms um, that you need to be thinking about flooding if we have a riparian pasture that we usually turn out in the spring, maybe avoiding that um, because it's gonna be a mess for one and you're gonna have a decline in health, but also that that is gonna tear that pasture up and may reduce its productivity in the long run. Other thing is, you know, a lot of you aren't thinking about drought right now, except for maybe those of you that were impacted in 2018 but we do we did see that de that delay in grazing readiness from those areas impacted by the 2017 drought if they were grazed hard we also see a decrease in productivity so this is a good example of that delay in oliver county last year our western wheat grass on in mid-may was at the one and a half leaf stage compared to the three and a half leaf stage um, early May the year before and there's a pretty significant it's probably hard to see in these photos but there's a pretty significant difference in the productivity and the height of the forge in those in those two pictures and they we actually seen that as it, it stayed pretty stunted as it got to the three and a half leaf stage um, there was an isolated part of the state that did experience drought in 2018 so if you were in that area you also 
some of you also had the experience drought in, in 17. And so being cautious um, and maybe not starting on pastures that you put extra pressure on in those, in those years so they have a little extra time to recover. As always, try not, you know, not overgrazing. If you do put a little extra pressure on a pasture, make sure that you're allowing enough time for it to recover from that extra pressure. So if you started in a, you're starting in one of your native pastures early in the grazing season this year, making sure that you don't come back into that pasture again until next fall. And if you need any help with um, some thoughts or ideas on how and grazing management strategies, you can contact me, contact your extension agent or your NRCS and they'll be glad to help you um, set up some strategies there. So with that, I am gonna turn it over back over to Dr. Charlie with so he's gonna have some closing remarks and then we can open it up for question and answer. All right, uh, thank you, Miranda. And thanks to all our presenters out there. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the time you've taken and, and our uh, attendees out there might notice that many of our specialists are doing this from home. And so we wanna thank you for the opportunity to come into your homes tonight and from ours to yours. So uh, this is the question and answer time. Uh, we have a few questions as we go through these. Um, if you have other questions, please type them in. And so the first question, actually I'm going to call on Dr. Stucka and the question is, can you feed a hyper thermic calf colostrum. I've heard that a calf won't utilize the colostrum until its internal body temp is increased and it will just sit in the calf's stomach and cause bloat. Is this true? Yeah, good question. And I think when we talk, we were talking about the need for colostrum no matter what method you're warming the calf. I think I did say sometime during that warming process you need to get colostrum into that calf um, because you won't have as much success with warming the calf unless that calf has, and granted this is warm colostrum, so that actually helps a little bit as well. So it's just, it's every bit as important as your warming method, whether it's a hot box or, or a warm water bath. I'm not telling you to put in the, col the colostrum before you start warming the process, but at least sometime during that warming process, put colostrum into that calf and it'll help, it'll help that calf uh, build his own energy uh, in addition to what you're already providing to, to warm that calf. All right, thanks, Jerry. Um, next one, I think Miranda, uh, I'm gonna call on you, what growth stage should cows be turned out? And I think the growth stage is with, uh, what growth stage should cows be turned out on winter annual pastures, such as winter rye? So we want to turn it out at, a veg at the vegetative stage. I would use the same rule of thumb as we do for our introduced grasses, like the three leaf stage. Um, with these, if you manage it correctly and don't, don't graze it too low, you can actually take them off and you'll get regrowth that you'll be able to graze again. So managing the grazing and one of the keys with these is a lot of people aren't watching these pastures. They have a lot of other things going on. So getting them out early enough so you can get that wreath growth, because once you, it heads out, you don't have that potential for regrowth, and there's a serious decline in quality too. All right, thanks, Miranda. Uh, the next question I have is, uh, well, this is a toss up. Uh, I, I think I'll call on Dr. Hoppy first, but then other panelists can uh, come in on that. Feeding in late afternoon and early evening, I heard is better for calving. I was told, is this true? I'm not sure if it's better for actually calving, but if you're looking for calving, uh, changing the time frame which cattle calve throughout the day, feeding in the evening will tend to delay calving until earlier in the morning. You'll end up having less nighttime calvings if you're feeding late in the afternoon or early evening. Um, Actually, the opposite is true in sheep. By feeding them within four or five hours, you'll end up having more lambs to happen. So if you don't if you want to get away from nighttime uh, watches in sheep, be sure to feed them in the morning. If you want to get away from nighttime ca calving, be sure to feed the cattle at night or late evening. All right, thanks, Carl. Um, we're at, uh, wow, we're an hour and 15 minutes we've been at this, and thank you very much uh, and all those uh, attending. Uh, 
Um, one last call for questions. I'm going to call on the presenters if there's any final comments that anything has come up while you watched each other present uh, things that you want to make a point of. Otherwise, uh, if there's no questions, so I'm going to pause here a little bit and see. Could um, we share the link that you can find the feed cost calculator? Sure, uh, Carl, if you, what, oh, what we're going to do is uh, at the end of this session, and you typed in an email, uh, so we should be able to email you. We have some other supporting documents that we're going to send to all the attendees that were tuned in tonight. So we'll be sending those. So if there are anything else, put it in the question box if there's something uh, else you want us to send out, but we will be uh, sending out uh, that information. Uh, let's see, I'm trying going down my checklist here. I think we've covered most everything. Uh, any other specialists have any uh, final comments or thoughts? Uh, Dr. Charlie, I just I guess I just tell the audience still at this point that we are available. Our phones are almost always on and so you can get a hold of us and if you have any more questions why we uh, we're willing and able to, to help in any any way we can. Thanks, Jerry. Um, anybody else? So I, I just want to close with uh, well, thanks. Oh, just a minute, Dr. Charlie, I was just going to say, uh, NDSU leads the University of Nebraska Omaha, 48 to 39 with 12:20 left in the second half, and that's to go to the big NCAA tournament. <laughs> thanks, Lisa, uh, and that's <laughs> that's great. Uh, okay. okay, so. so Hang on. Uh, thanks again for Zooming with us tonight. On behalf of India Extension, uh, we wish to uh, wish you the best over the next few days. It, it doesn't look like it's going to be very nice weather out there. If you have more questions at a later date, please contact your local county-based extension agent. Uh, they can field your questions or uh, they can also get in touch with us. They have all our contact information. When this webinar concludes, uh, you should be linked to a brief survey to leave feedback for us. Uh, we are very interested in your experience this evening with us and the use of this webinar technology. And we want to learn from you. So if at all possible, please take a few minutes and give us your feedback. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you for your time tonight and uh, good night.